Charisma is like magic. Charisma is kind of the last actual form of magic that we have in the world. And people traditionally react to the fact that there's still magic in the world in one of two ways. Some people pretend that there is no magic. There is no charisma. It doesn't actually have effect. A lot of, you know, the tech world would like to believe that technology moves the mountains. But really, charisma, that magic, moves bigger mountains than technology ever has and maybe ever will. There are other people who love charisma because it's magic and they kind of want it to stay magic. What I'm excited about today is that Olivia, who's come here to speak to us, has been laying that patient out on the table and really kind of for the first time dissecting it to look at what makes it magic. In some ways it's kind of sad but also really brave and tremendously exciting to take one of these things which we don't understand and to make it apparent and understandable to us. Uh, and I think this is an incredibly exciting frontier. Olivia's at the front of it. Her book has been, is in its second printing, maybe headed for its third, and it hasn't even come out yet. <laughs> it's already been a huge success in the schools where she's been teaching it. We're very lucky to have her here. Please help me welcome my good friend, Olivia. Thank you, Esther. So the question I'm always asked when I start speaking is, of course, because of the book title, what is the charisma myth? And the first and easy one to bust is that charisma is not innate. It can be learned. And here's how. So the fact that charisma is not innate was the first one that kind of took us by surprise. But I can tell you that in control laboratory experiments, researchers were able to lower or raise people's level of charisma like turning a dial just by instructing them to display certain specific charismatic behaviors. This is what the research has found. Charisma is nothing but a set of specific behaviors. So of course, the next question is, what are these behaviors? Turns out that there are three main components to charisma. The first is presence. This is the foundation upon which all else rests. If you speak to people who've met Bill Clinton, this is the, one of the first things that they talk about. Clinton has, he has an extraordinary presence, right? He's, and what presence means is simply that. The ability to fully focus on the person that you're speaking to. The ability to make them feel that they're the only person in the room. And of course, Clinton is known to do that to an extraordinary degree. And I've met hardened Republicans who've told me, Bill Clinton, I hated him before I met him. I hated him after I met him. But while I met him, man, I love the man. <laughs> Without presence, everything falls apart. Have you ever been in a conversation where only half your mind was present and the other half was busy doing something else? Raise your hands if, that, if that's ever happened to you. Awesome. When that happens, you may think that you are getting away with it. We think we can fake presence. We think we can fake listening. We think that as long as we seem attentive and kind of pay attention to what's going on, we've done enough. But we're wrong. In that conversation, when only half your mind was present and the only half was busy doing something else, there is a good chance that your facial expressions were a split second delayed and your eyes got a slight glazed over look, tiny. And yet, people will catch that. Because people will read your face in as fast as 17 to 32 milliseconds. At a gut level, when there's that slight delay, it gives a feeling that there's something not quite right, something that doesn't quite fit. At worst, they get the feeling that you are inauthentic. Nothing kills charisma faster than appearing inauthentic. The used car salesman approach does not work well. Not recommended. So, 
presence, of course, the question you're going to ask me is, how do you get it? How do you ensure that you are present in the conversation? My favorite trick is also one of the most simple you can find. Focus on your toes. And the reason I mean that is that your toes are about as far from your brain as possible. It makes your brain sweep through your entire body at high speed to feel all the physical sensations up and down. It gets you physically present in the moment. You can do that right now. Just by focusing on your toes, you will have upped your level of charisma right away. <laughs> Didn't know your toes are going to be crucial to charisma. By the way, something I should mention is that there is no Q&A period at the end of this talk. The time to ask questions is now. Stop me at any time, raise your hands, chat out, I'll be fine with that. So your toes, right, that's, um, that's number one. Mm. Um, technique number two is to focus on the pupils of the person that you are speaking to. And you'll be surprised to see how in their irises and pupils, there are an extraordinary array of colors that can keep you quite captivated. And better yet, they will give you that deep, soul-searching eye contact. That is absolutely fantastic, a true Clinton-esque approach. Beware of the consequences, of course, but we won't go into that today. <laughs> yes? So when people do this kind of stuff to me, I find it really creepy. When they do this thing to you, you find it really creepy. The deep soul-searching eye contact? Yes. Yeah, don't overdo. <laughs> so when two human beings stare deeply into one another's eyes, there's an adrenaline-like substance called PEA, or phenylethylamine, that goes gushing through your bloodstream and theirs. It is the same hormone that produces the phenomenon we call love at first sight. So it's a very useful hormone. Throughout this talk, what I'm actually going to be teaching you to do is how to play chemist with your own brain to get a more charismatic brain. However, in studies where rows of two strangers were asked to stare intently in one another's eyes, within just a few minutes, Participants reported increased affection and some even passionate feelings for one another. <laughs> so clearly, you don't want to overdo it, but it can be very effective. This is only to keep yourself present, and if you think that this is not going to feel comfortable, switch to the third one. Here's the third. You know how in independent movies and in indie movies, the main character, even if he is a completely uninteresting, I'm thinking uh, Clerk, Small Rats, any Kevin Smith movie, yet they become fascinating to you just because they are the hero of the movie, yes? Do that with the person you're speaking to. Pretend that they're the, the, the hero of an indie movie. All right, so that's presence. So the next is power. Thanks, Bronwyn. And there's a misconception about power, which is that someone who's powerful comes across, that power is like the power to command an army. That's actually incorrect. The way we perceive power in someone is through signs of status, such as, of course, expensive clothing, titles, corner office, or how other people around that person react to them. But most of all, it's in body language. If someone appears confident, we will assume that they have something to be confident about. The key thing to remember is that, in general, People will accept whatever you project. So one of the main things to talk about here, because very few people ever do, is what kills confidence? What kills that projection of power? Yeah, yeah. self-doubt, specifically. Self-criticism. And in one of the manifestations of self-doubt known as the imposter syndrome, competent people feel that they don't really know what they're doing, and it's only a matter of time before they're found out and exposed as a fraud. The interesting thing about the imposter syndrome is that the higher up the intelligence ladder you go, the worse it hits. I know that every time I speak at MIT, at Harvard, at Yale, at Stanford, you could hear the, a pin drop, the room go silent, and every year the incoming class of Stanford GSB is asked, how many of you in here feel that you are the one mistake the admissions committee made? <laughs> every year, two-thirds of the students immediately raise their hand. So the original researchers estimated that it hits about 70 to 80 percent of the population. It can have pretty unfortunate effects on our creativity because the imposter syndrome tends to launch the, th the threat response, the sympathetic nervous system, which you, I'm sure you've heard about. That's the fight or flight response, which launches adrenaline and cortisol through our veins. And when you're in a 
in a threat response, um, there's a fantastic uh, podcast on iTunes on Stanford, Stanford U called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, which I highly recommend. When you're in fight or flight mode, your body wants you surviving the next 10 seconds. It doesn't care about the next 10 years. So it's going to put all its resources towards the important stuff like muscle reaction, like breathing rate, like heart rate, and it's going to shut down all the superfluous functions, such as cognitive reasoning, really not important at that moment, free association, and all the stuff that's kind of important for innovation. So in the work I've been doing on, on the mental side of innovation, the psychology of innovation, we found that things such as the imposter syndrome, self-doubt, and self-criticism, and of course the inability to handle uncertainty, kills your innovation potential. It's pretty dramatic. So of course, next question is, how do you handle the imposter syndrome? How do you handle self-doubt? There are three steps. We're going to cover one right now, and hopefully we'll have the time to cover the next two um, under the warmth heading. The first one you've actually just done right now. Destigmatization, lifting the stigma off the experience. Because one of the hardest burdens for the human being to bear, one of the emotions that kills us faster than anything else is shame. There's a fantastic TED talk by Brene Brown on shame and vulnerability that I would highly recommend. All you need to know is that just by knowing that the imposter syndrome has a name, that it's normal, that you, you can see it as simply a legacy of your genetic heritage, just like our, our, append, our appendix. Sometimes the appendix gets inflamed and we get an appendicitis. Sometimes the imposter syndrome acts us and we get an attack of the imposter syndrome. Same thing, no big deal. That's step one. Step two and three, which is detach and rewrite, we'll hopefully have the time to see that in the warm section. But for now, what I'd like to do is give you a sense of how broadcasting confidence and power through your body language works. This is called learning to display alpha gorilla body language. <laughs> so if you think of a gorilla, right? Imagine a gorilla who owns half the jungle. Rival comes in, breaches his territory. Gorilla is annoyed. Um, what would the gorilla do? Beats his chest, right? Inflates, makes big noises. Why is he doing that? To create fear. To create fear, how? If you, I think I heard it. By looking, By looking bigger. And what Stanford researchers have found is that guess what? Humans do the same thing. High status, confident people tend to use furniture, quote unquote, wrong. They will sit on the table. They'll drape their arms on two chairs. They'll put their feet on the table. They'll put their feet on three chairs. What they're doing is that they're claiming more space as theirs. They're being alpha gorillas. So what you need to learn, think of the opposite, right? Which is the, 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 nervous, uh, you know, the nervous kid who's kind of hunched over, huddling over. That is not alpha gorilla body language. So if you wouldn't mind, put down laptops, books, whatever, stand up. They didn't tell you that it was a, a physical exercise? to wear comfortable clothing and, um, and good shoes. All right, uh, stretch your arms towards the ceilings and, and, and try to touch the ceiling with your fingertips. Thank you. Awesome, now put your uh, fingertips towards the side of the wall. Sides of the wall, people. It should not be this difficult. I see that math is not your forte, clearly. All right, you can just let your arms drop. Roll your shoulders back. And now I want you to inflate, puff up, take about as much air as you can. You can exhale. Put your arms behind your back. And now what I want you to do is imagine that you are a five-star general reviewing his troops. So how does that look? Right? You, you get your, your feet a little bit wider. You're going to tilt your nose up a little bit. because Imagine a troop of GI Joes passing in front of you, and you're kind of reviewing them as they pass by. All right, do you feel a physical change through your body? Yes, excellent. What is happening is that when people take expansive poses, which is what the, this is called, you get a flood of assertiveness promoting hormones through your veins. You are learning to play chemist with your own brain. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You can sit down. So this is a, a virtual cycle because the more you take on an expansive pose, the more you'll get those uh, chemicals flowing through your body, which of course is going to affect your body language, which gives you yet another boost, etc. All you have to do is get the cycle going. 
So what I'm often asked is, it's great if I can look powerful and confident, that's fantastic, but how do I avoid appearing arrogant? If you think back towards the pose you were taking, when people are considered to be arrogant or snobbish, it's often said that they were looking down their nose at someone. Yeah? What this means is that their head was tilted too far up. So in order to appear non-arrogant, you just bring your chin down. This has the added benefit of opening up your eyes wider, which is going to make you appear more thoughtful and more intelligent, which is kind of a nice combination. The other thing is to pause for two seconds before you speak. This will again give the impression that you are giving such consideration to their statement because it is so important that you can't just answer back like that, you've got to absorb it. And um, one of my good friends who's here in the audience today said that when he was here at Google um, meeting Clinton for the first time, and he was so excited to meet the foreign president, comes up to him and he's, he's so nervous that he doesn't know what to say and he finds himself looking at him, uh, Mr. President, thank you for the, your service to this country. And the minute he said that, he was like, oh God. But Clinton takes it as saying, thank you so much. And he, he was like, the, it was like the most amazing thing someone had ever told him. And my friend says, that, he nailed it. I have never seen anyone take a compliment that way. So pausing for two seconds before you speak. You can actually try the Alpha Gorilla exercise as you're walking down the street. And what's fascinating is that realize that when we're moving through an environment, subconsciously, our brain is constantly scanning our surroundings for anything that we need to deviate around, whether it be inanimate or whether it be animate, i.e. human. And we are constantly reading one another's body language to decide how to react, and in this situation, whether to move aside or not. If they seem like a bigger alpha gorilla than we are, we're gonna move aside. But if we are broadcasting the stronger alpha gorilla body language, they're gonna move aside. So one of the assignments that I give to my clients, which was actually I first heard from a, um, a young Stanford boxing student, their coach had given them this assignment of go to a crowded environment, be the alpha gorilla. And your job is to make people move aside for you. I don't care if it means a collision. You'll learn to apologize later. For the moment, be the alpha gorilla. And some of my, my, my clients who've tried this told me it's amazing. It was like Moses parting the sea. They could see people, as they were walking around with that alpha gorilla body language, they could see people parting way for them. So try that in, of course, a non-dangerous situation. <laughs> All right. So that's power. We've seen presence. We've seen power. Remind me what the third one is. Warmth, excellent, they're paying attention, fantastic. Warmth is not comfortable for many of us. For many of us, warmth is that category of messy, uncomfortable feeling range. We'd much rather stay in the nice, well-organized space of our heads. Unfortunately, warmth is absolutely critical to charisma. All three components, presence, power, and warmth, are critical to charisma. You cannot delete any one of them entirely. The only thing that will change is depending which element of charisma is strongest, which element, whether it be presence or power or warmth, you'll get different kinds of charisma. High warmth, or higher warmth, is for example, kindness charisma, what the Dalai Lama has. Higher power, is your authority charisma, which is your classic you know, dictator charisma. They all have different benefits. Authority charisma is super useful when you're in a crisis situation and you need people to obey and react fast. Terrible for brainstorming. It kills uh, critical thinking and feedback. Uh, warmth charisma is wonderful when you've got someone who's coming to you with a big problem. You kind of wrap them in around a, 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 um, a pink fluffy blanket cocoon not so useful when you're trying to get people to move and get out of the fire fast. So the important thing about warmth to know is that you cannot fake warmth. The reason for that is that warmth is, is evaluated entirely and completely through body language. And the thing is 
there, there is far too much body language for us to control consciously. Were you aware of your eyelids fluttering in front of your eyes until I mentioned it right now? How about the weight of your tongue in your mouth? What about the position of your toes? Had you forgotten your eyelids again? <laughs> it is impossible for us to control our body language entirely. Even when we control the main expression on our face, sooner or later, what's called a micro-expression will flash. And the problem is that even if it's as fast as 17 to 32 milliseconds, as you know, people will catch that. And on a gut level, if the main expression, the micro, are incompatible, incongruent is a technical term, they'll get the gut feeling that there's something that's not quite right, something doesn't quite fit, and you'll come across as inauthentic. This is why great actors were exhausted after great performances because they had been working so hard to get their entire body language in congruence. And even with years of training, it was impossible to get it perfectly in congruence because think of it, every minute you have tens of thousands of units of body language pouring out of you. So what did Hollywood do? What form of acting did they come up with? Method acting, what's method acting? You have the emotion. What that means is that you don't try to control the body language you actually try to control the source, which is your subconscious mind. In Hollywood, this is called method acting. In sports, it's called sports psychology or visualization, and 86% of American Olympic athletes use this tool. Golfer Jack Nicklaus used to say he would never hit a shot, even in practice, without visualizing it first. So you're gonna try it for yourselves. Could you please find someone in the room that you do not like? <laughs> I am kidding. Turn towards your neighbor. Find a neighbor torn towards him or her. Just look at each other. That's all you need to do. All right, people. Just look at each other, not me. Look at each other's eyes. Look at each other's eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. I want you to think of a problem at work. Something annoying, irritating, embarrassing. Something uncertain. Something the outcome of which is a real problem. Get into that problem. Open your eyes. <laughs> All right, I think you got the message. Close your eyes again. Close your eyes again. Now, I'd like you to think of one person in your life that you have great affection for. Whether this be a human being, or a pet, or even a stuffed animal. Find one being that you could have great affection for, and just think of, feel, your affection for them, and their affection for you. Open your eyes. <laughs> did you see a difference in their face? Where did you see the biggest difference? The eyes, all right. What are the eyes? How many of you are thinking the windows to the soul? Yeah. You are absolutely right. The area around the eyes is the most mobile of the entire human face and therefore also the most expressive, which is why poker players wear sunglasses. Shipping magnet um, Onassis used to also wear sunglasses when he was negotiating shipping contracts so that opponents could not see what he was thinking. So your eyes is one of the biggest tellers of warmth. The other one is your voice. Voice is critical. One of my favorite stats to quote is that the MIT Media Lab was able to predict with 87% accuracy the outcome of sales calls, negotiations, and business plan pitches without listening to a single word of content. 
only by analyzing the voice fluctuation and the facial expressions of the person pitching. So with voice, what you'll want to get is a highly fluctuating voice. Think of someone speaking to a baby. You know how your voice goes all sing-song when you do that? That's what you want to do. Not that exaggerated, but that's a direction. What you'll want to work against is anyone with a nasal voice, you're at a disadvantage. Nasal voices just tend to sound colder. They're less easy or pleasant to listen to. So if that's the case, yes, Ming? This one would be a nasal voice. I'm, of course, exaggerating. But take me as an example. My voice tends to fluctuate off, off the charts. I'm a professional speaker. This is what I do. You don't, have to, you, you don't need to have a voice that is that fluctuating. But think of playing with um, speed, pitch, tempo, intonation. The worst, the, the, the um, opposite would be a flat monotone voice that is also cold and nasal. All right. Yes, oh, completely. You can learn to tweak your voice at will. The same thing for voice, and though you cannot control, again, you can't control directly your, your facial expressions and body language, because if I were to tell you exactly the kind of body language you want for charisma, you'd have to be controlling 10,000, at least 10,000 different pieces of body language at the same time. Much faster to go straight to the source, get the specific image you want, and that will affect the entire body language. So again, to recap, tell me what you've learned today. What is charisma? Presence, power, and warmth. Thank you. What else? Body language is important. All right, I think we've got that one straight. Um, body language is absolutely critical. Charisma is a whole lot of body language. There is, of course, a whole lot more to it, which you will find in the book. I have not quite enough time for that today. But here are two good ways to reach me for all the questions that I haven't answered yet. My email is olivia at askolivia.com. And the website is, of course, askolivia.com. On the website, you'll find many freebies, including a breakdown of how Steve Jobs methodically learned charisma step by step. Because I have news for you. Steve Jobs is one of those who learned charisma. He was not born with it. With that said, ladies and gentlemen, it was absolutely a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you very much.